shot. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. Now, you know, first of all, you know, it's, it is Resurrection Sunday, right? So most churches are preaching on the resurrection. I mean, if you attend pretty much any church, a Baptist church, a Catholic church, an Anglican church, whatever it is, they're going to probably be preaching about the resurrection. And you might be wondering, why, Kevin, why are you, you know, preaching from chapter 9 when it's Resurrection Sunday? Shouldn't you be preaching about the resurrection? And I will cover the resurrection in this, in this chapter. Okay? I know it wasn't really mentioned as a whole, but I'll, I'll cover it. Don't worry. I'll figure out a way how to do that. But look at verse number one. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? So the first thing that Paul is mentioning in this chapter, he's asking the church in Corinthian, am I not an apostle? I am your apostle. Okay, because what you see soon later on is that people were criticizing Paul. Okay, people were saying that he's not an apostle, he's not like the 12 that were like that were with Jesus Christ. And what you find in this chapter is that Paul is uplifting not himself but his position as an apostle of Christ. And he says, Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? So what is the criteria? What is one of the qualifications of being an apostle according to Paul in this verse here? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Okay. First thing that I need you to understand, and we're going to turn to, maybe you can t keep a finger there in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, but turn to Acts chapter 1 as well. Acts chapter 1. But one of the conditions, one of the qualifications to be an apostle, to have that office is that you have seen, you have physically seen the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should tell you something straight away about false apostles in our day and age. Okay? Because we have not seen nobody in this generation, nobody for the past 2,000, well, let's, let's be a bit more accurate, 1,900 and some 80 years has not seen Jesus Christ. Okay? So there are no such things as apostles today. That office has been finished. There was a purpose for the apostles. That was to kickstart the New Testament church, but the condition was to physically have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, but now look at Acts chapter 1, verse 21. Because you'll remember that Judas Iscariot killed himself. He committed suicide after betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. So the 12 apostles needed someone else to fill that position. And look at verse 21. Wherefore of these men, so they're trying to decide, which of these men can we have to fill the shoes of Judas Iscariot? Who can be the twelfth apostle according to Peter and the others that were discussing this? Wherefore of these men, which have accompanied with us all the time, that the Lord Jesus, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? So what are the conditions of this person that we're going to choose? Verse 22 beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us. So the person that we need to choose is someone that was there with us from John's baptism. When John was doing the baptism, baptisms, uh, and then it says, and that was taken unto the same day that he was taken up from us. So the, so the ones that have saw Jesus Christ ascended up to heaven. Okay, From baptism to seeing Jesus Christ ascend up to heaven, but also this, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection? So if you were there for John's baptism, but you didn't see his resurrection, Jesus Christ did not reveal himself to you, you did not qualify to be an apostle from the opinion of Peter. Okay, this is Peter's opinion. But what you'll notice is that these people, the, the one that they were going to choose to be an apostle, also had to visibly have seen the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now, Paul does not fit the criteria that Peter lays out here. He was not there during uh, John's baptism, but he did see the Lord Jesus Christ. He did see the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Paul did on the road to Damascus, if you remember that. When he was on his road to Damascus, Jesus Christ appeared to him and he was blinded. Right? He was asking, who are you? And, and Jesus Christ revealed himself to be the Lord Jesus Christ the same Lord that he was persecuting. So when we take this passage in Acts chapter 1 and we take the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we can see what the criteria was, what the requirement was, that they had physically seen the Lord Jesus Christ, but not just seen him, 
but seen him in his resurrected body. Seen him in his glorified, resurrected body. So we don't have a contradiction here, okay? We just have the opinion of Peter in Acts chapter 1, and then we have Paul reinforcing, hey, that is the requirement, to have seen the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrected body. Now back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Actually, go to 1 Corinthians 15. So keep your finger still in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because Paul acknowledges the fact that he doesn't line up perfectly with Peter's opinion of being an apostle. Okay, and we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 7. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. After that, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. So this is the resurrected Jesus Christ. He was seen of James, then all the apostles. And then verse 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So he says, look, I'm someone that's, that's like a delayed birth. I, I've come late to the party. Okay, Because he, he recognizes from the conditions that Peter laid out for being an apostle, he wasn't there for the baptism of John. He wasn't there for the crucifixion of Christ and the, and the resurrection of Christ. But he did, Jesus Christ did appear to Paul physically um, in his resurrected body. And that's why he refers to himself as one born out of due time. And then because of that, in verse number 9, we see Paul's humility. He says, For I am the least of the apostles. I am the least of the apostles. Even though we have more New Testament scripture written by Paul than anyone else, he says, I am the least. And I, I believe that's why God used Paul in such a powerful way. Because if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. And we see God, we see the Lord Jesus Christ exalt Paul the apostle, and affirm his apostleship as well. For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he sees himself, man, I was an enemy. While those others were following Christ, they were listening to his teaching, I hated it. You know, I was persecuting the believers when I had the ability to do so. And that's why he considers himself as the least. And you know what? You may have started in your life poorly. You may have been very worldly. You may have been saved late in your life. You might be, as someone like Paul says, born out of due time, saved later in your life. But you can be exalted by the Lord Jesus Christ. You can still do great things for God. How old was, was Moses when he delivered Israel out of Egypt? Do you guys know? 80 years old. 80 years old when he, when he finally did anything substantial for the Lord, got into um, Egypt and delivered and like Moses is one of the greatest men that you're going to read about in the Bible. So, hey, don't feel bad. Yes, you know, we were speaking yesterday about the kids having this great opportunity. You guys can start young and serve the Lord as a young age. And, you know, we regret not having started earlier ourselves. But at the same time, even if you do start late, you can be exalted by God. You can still do great things for the Lord Jesus Christ the same way Paul the Apostle did. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2. Verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 2, Paul says, If I be not an apostle unto others... So if there's other people that's not of this church, other people saying I'm not an apostle, he goes, yet doubtless I am to you. I am your apostle. Don't worry about what the others are saying. You know that I am your apostle. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. You are my proof, Corinthian church. As messed up as they were, they were his proof that he was an apostle. Because remember, he came into, Corinth, uh, into, the, into uh, Corinth. He, he came preaching the gospel. He got them saved. He established this church. He was leading this church, even when, away in his missionary's journey. He was sending people into this church to help them learn and grow. And so they, as a church, as an established church of the Lord Jesus Christ, was proof that he was their apostle. Regardless of what other people were saying, who cares what other people were saying? It wasn't important. Verse number three. Mine answer to them, mine answer to them that do examine me in this. So those who criticize Paul, this is his answer to them. Okay, that they are his, um, you know, uh, his seal of his apostleship. But look, let's look down at verse number four. Have we not power to eat and to drink? Okay, so he's starting off with something very basic. He's starting off with something very... He goes, do we not have the ability or the authority or the power to eat and drink? Okay, we all eat and drink. 
We all have, all of us have the power to eat and to drink. So he starts with something very minor, but then he starts to build up from that. He starts to build up from that thought. Verse number five, he says, Have we not power to lead about a sister? And by what he means by a sister, he means a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. Now, before I, I talk about verse 5, look down at verse number 6. Or I only and Barnabas have, have not we power to forbear working. So he's speaking here on behalf of himself and Barnabas. Okay, so Barnabas was his partner at the time that he wrote this letter. And one of the interesting things, if you ever have time, is try to study out Paul's missionary journeys. Now, I don't think anybody knows 100% sure of his journey, okay? Like, where did he start? What towns did he go into? But we get a rough idea by reading the letters. Because when we read 1 Corinthians 15, we see that he is still with Barnabas. But then we read in the book of Acts that he and Barnabas later on have an argument and they split ways. So we know that this was written before they had that argument. And so that's one of the very interesting things. I might do a study like this on a Thursday one day and just go through Paul's missionary journeys as best as I know how. Uh, but what you find, if you look it up, there's, there's many different variations of what people believe. But that's just an interesting study if you ever wanted to, if, if you thought, what, what do I study now? That would, that would be really interesting. But I wanted to point to you back to verse number four, uh, five. Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife? So do we not have the ability uh, or the authority to get married? Okay, so we know that Paul was a single man. Some people have said that Paul was divorced, okay? But no, I mean, he, he wasn't divorced because he says, I have the ability to get remarried, okay? He's saying, and that would, tr that would be true for Barnabas as well. Neither he nor Barnabas were married. Again, just, just an encouragement to those that are single. You can do great things uh, for the Lord even as a single person, okay? Even as a single man or a single lady, you can do great things for God, but he says, look, I have the power to eat and drink. I have the ability, I have the power to get married as well as other apostles. So the other apostles were married. The other apostles had wives, had children, had families. Okay? And what you'll understand what he's leading to now is that he has the ability and the power to be paid by the church. Okay? A lot of people argue and say, well, <clears throat> you know, pastors should not be paid by the church. You know, workers should not be paid by the church. And currently, I'm not being paid by the church. But I'm not asking you to put more money into the offering to be paid. I recognize that. I prepared for that. You know, we need to start small. At some point as we grow, hopefully I will be able to be paid by the church. But you'll see how his thought develops and he talks about how he has the ability or the authority or the power to be paid by the church. Because these other apostles had families. These other apostles had wives. And then he refers to one, 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 one of the others. He says, And as the brethren of the Lord, in verse 5, and Cephas. So who's Cephas? Do you guys remember who Cephas is? Who was he? Peter. Peter was Cephas. And you know when you read the Gospels that uh, Peter had a mother-in-law because Jesus came and healed his mother-in-law. So we know that Peter was uh, married um, and so he must have had children which just flies in the face of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church says Peter was their first pope. And yet, what's their requirement for a pope? To remain celibate, to, to be unmarried. And if you're married, you're not fit to be a pope. And yet, Peter had a mother-in-law. How did he get a mother-in-law without getting married? Why would you have a mother-in-law if you don't even have a wife? <laughs> right? do, do you want the struggles of having a mother-in-law but with not having a wife? <laughs> no way. You know, Peter, Peter was married. Anyway. He says, look, the other apostles were married and had families. Uh, verse number six, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? So what is he saying? Me and Barnabas, we work. You know, we have a, a job outside of preaching the gospel. We have work outside of, of uh, teaching the churches. And we know that Paul was a tent maker. We know that was one of his, uh, you know, trades that he had. I don't know if he had other skills and abilities, but that was one thing that he was doing. He would sell tents. Okay? He would sell tents, and that's how he made his living. And I guess, as a single man, it's probably a lot easier to provide for yourself than provide you know, uh, for a family. But he says, look, do we not have the ability or the power to forbear? Have, we not, uh, have not we power to forbear working? Hey, we should have the ability to stop our secular jobs. We should have the ability to stop working and be provided by the, the, uh, by the offering of the churches. 
Okay? We have that ability, we have that power, both Barnabas and I. And look at verse number seven. For who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? So who goes to war? If you're a soldier, if you get enlisted in the army, who goes and buys their own you know, equipment? Who buys their own guns? Who buys their own uniforms? Who goes and buys their own helmet and their own boots and their own knife, or whatever else, you know, their own uh, uh, food that they would need, their own jackets and the clothing, the extra clothing they need to go to war? Does a soldier do that? Does a soldier go and buy their own things and then go and fight? No. When he's enlisted in the army, the army provides all the equipment, right? The army provides the clothing, the weapons, the boots, the, the helmet, you know, the training, all the costs, the cost of the food, it's all provided by the army. And he's, he's likening himself to that soldier, okay? And then he continues saying, Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof. So if you plant, I don't know if you've ever planted like fruit trees or or anything, you know, that grows and that you can eat of, who doesn't then go and eat that fruit, you know? I mean, that's just crazy, right? You do the work, you plant the vineyard, you go and plant the fruit trees, you go plant the lemon trees, but you never go and actually take off that fruit? I mean, that's ridiculous, right? You know, common sense would indicate if you're going to do the work, you're going to also partake of the fruit of that work. And then it says he, Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Okay, so if you have cattle, you have sheep, do you not then partake of, you know, what, what the animal produces, whether that's the milk or, or you, know, you know, eating, you know, lamb or, or whatever it is? You know, if anyone does the work, you do it to be paid. You do it to be rewarded, right? I mean, the reason why you go to work Monday to Friday is to get your paycheck. You wouldn't do it if you weren't getting paid for it, right? That's just logical, common sense that he says here in verse number seven. So a, a, farmer, a farmer works hard. You know, farming is hard. And of course, they're going to enjoy the fruit of their labor. But look at verse number eight, 1 Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight. Say, I these things as a man. You know, yes, I'm just giving you examples of, like a man, okay? You know, it's common sense for man to partake of the fruit of their labor. But then he says this, Or saith not the law the same thing? So not only is it common sense for man, but the law of God, the Bible itself, says the same thing. And where does it say the same thing? Okay, it's, it's, um, we'll look at verse number nine. For it is written in the law of Moses. What did Moses write about? That pastors and apostles ought to be paid? Well, what did Moses write? Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? Now, that reference, I've always told you, if you see where it's written, you can go back to the Old Testament and have a look where it is written. And I'll just read it to you. It's in Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. It says, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. Okay? So if someone's using an ox to do farming, don't muzzle the ox. Don't put something on its mouth where it can't eat as it works, okay? And because otherwise, I mean, the animal's going to lose strength, it's going to lose energy, you know, it, it's, gonna want, it's going to want to eat, and if it eats, it's going to be able to work more for you, right? It's going to do more work for you. And yet God's talking about an ox in Deuteronomy. Now, if you go and read that chapter, it's, it's kind of like this random verse out of nowhere. Like, he's not, really, he's not even talking about animals. But all of a sudden, he just talks about the ox, Right? And it kind of like, if you're reading the Old Testament by itself, it kind of looks like, oh, that's a bit weird. Just, just out of nowhere, he talks about the ox and, and making sure that you don't prevent the ox from eating the corn that it treads. But then Paul explains why. It's, it's sort of this random verse um, there in verse number 9. So he goes, actually in verse number 10, in verse number 10, Or saith he it all together for our sakes. So did God say this for the ox? I mean, yes, obviously, literally, yes, for the ox. But doth God take care for oxen? Was it for the oxen that he said this verse? I mean, was the ox going to read Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 and know, hey, you need to feed me as I work? Was it for the ox? No. Verse number 10. Or save he it all together for our sakes. For our sakes. For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker 
of his hope. So he says, look, the reason why Moses wrote that in Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 was for our sakes, was for us, for those that are working for the church, the apostles, for the pastors, whoever it is, you know, evangelists, whoever it is that you're using to further the work of the church. That's why Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 was written for them. Hey, they're the ox. Don't prevent the worker from being paid, from, being, from, being, from uh, benefiting from the work that they're doing in their church. Saying, Kevin, why are you preaching about getting paid? Hey, I'm not, I'm not comfortable preaching this. Should pastors be paid? Yes, they should. But I don't want to tell you that. I'd rather just let you, the scriptures tell you that, right? The scriptures ought to tell you that pastors ought to be paid. And again, look, I'm not preaching this because I, I, I'm like, we need more money. And I, I, I'm fine. You know, we, we're sustaining ourselves quite well at the moment. I'm going a little bit backwards, I'll be honest with you, but not as badly as I thought I would. We're doing, we're doing pretty well. And we're preaching this because we're up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But still, it's the Word of God, it's important, it needs to be preached, okay? Now, verse number 11, verse number 11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, okay? So if we, like, it's like sowing the seed of spiritual things. Now, this isn't just preaching the gospel, because he's writing to a church, right? He's writing to the First Corinthian church that are already saved. So in what way is he sowing spiritual things, preaching the Word of God? teaching them the scriptures, right? Encouraging, encouraging them in the Lord. If he says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great things if we shall reap your carnal things? Now, what do you think is more important? The spiritual things or the carnal things? I'll let one of the kids answer that one. That one, spiritual things are more important. Why? Because they're everlasting, right? It's forever, Okay? The treasures that you lay up in heaven will never rust. Okay? No thief will ever be able to break in and take those things. The things that are spiritual will be with you forever. But the carnal things, what's carnal? You know, money is carnal, food is carnal, a house is carnal. You know, lots of things are carnal. Those things are temporary. Those things will rust and thieves can break in and steal those things. They're great. We use them. We need to use them in our life but they're not going to last forever, which is why God's going to give us a future home in heaven with our future resurrected bodies uh, that are perfect, okay? There, there's a great promise of eternal life in the future. We have eternal life now, but it's fully realized when we go to be with the Lord. So what's more important, the spiritual things than the carnal things? So if we're working, you know, not as a, as a farmer, not as a soldier, not as someone planting a vineyard, not just like an ox treading out the corn, but we're actually doing spiritual work, which is much greater than the carnal rewards, then is it such a great thing? You know, what's the big deal about taking the carnal things for ourselves so we can sustain ourselves? Sustain, you know, well, he didn't have a family, but the other apostles were taken and sustaining themselves and sustaining their families. Verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather... So there were other workers. I don't know if there were pastors in this church at this point in time. I don't know if it was just the other apostles going through. You know, we hear about uh, Peter. You know, obviously they knew of Peter. They knew of Apollos. Apollos came through teaching them as well. So I'm assuming he's talking about these other men. He says, if others be partakers of this power of you. So there were other people in this church that were getting paid for their work. Are not we rather, he says. So if there's other people getting paid, then shouldn't be more, more than them, shouldn't it, be, shouldn't it be us, Paul and Barnabas, that are getting paid? Because we're the one that establishes the church. We're the ones that got you saved. We're the ones that got you started, right? Now, is Paul right in all this because he's greedy for money? No, of course not, okay? Look at, verse, look, look at what he says, continuing on. Nevertheless, we have not used this power. Yes, we have the ability, we have the authority, we have the right to be paid by you, but we've not used this power, okay? He's refrained from that. He says, but suffer all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Now, that's, that's an interesting statement. He's saying, look, we've not taken anything from you. We've, we're not getting paid, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. So there was something going on at this time where if he was getting paid, maybe he, cause, because people were criticizing him and saying he's not an apostle. And so, he, you know, if he was getting paid, perhaps, I'm just giving you my opinion here, perhaps people were saying, hey, you know, you know, he's just filthy for, for money. You know, he's just greedy for money. And that will hinder the gospel, right? That will hurt the church. 
and say, well, no, I mean, Paul, Paul got us saved. I mean, Paul's doing great works for us, but it might cause further division and, and prevent the gospel of Christ uh, being preached. Or, or simply that he's saying this simply maybe that he doesn't need to be paid, right? Like hindering the gospel, like you are paying other people that are preaching the gospel, and so if I took from that, then maybe there wouldn't be enough for others to go and preach the gospel. That's another way to look at it as well. I'm not sure which is the right answer. Maybe you guys have some thoughts on that. You can share that with me. Feel free to do so. But what, the point is this. We see that Paul refrains from taking, from being paid, you know, from, being, from reaping the carnal things because he wants the gospel of Christ to go out to the area. Okay, whatever the reasons are, is not so important, but we see his heart. We see his humility. He'd rather just not be paid as long as the gospel is going out and, and th there's great work being done uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> uh, verse 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now, this is talking about the Old Testament practices. This is the Old Testament priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. If you don't know, the Levites did not inherit land. Okay, the tribe of, of the Levites did not inherit any land. It was given to the other tribes. And if they didn't inherit land, what does that mean? Can they farm? Can they grow anything on the land and provide for themselves? No, they won't be able to. Now, obviously, they stayed on land. They stayed on certain people's land, uh, but they could not provide for themselves. They could not go out farming. Because back then, you know, it was, it was agricultural, you know, farmers, you know, growing, growing um, you know, food or, 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 or having cattle in that sense. So the Levites weren't able to do that. They didn't have the ability to sustain themselves. But that was God's purpose. That was God's purpose. And then he says this, um, uh, so I'll just read it again. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? So how were the Levites providing for the, how, how were they provided for? Because things, it was by the things of the temple. In those days, people would come and bring their offering, right? They'd bring their tithes and their offering. They'd bring food. They'd bring uh, meat. They'd bring, you know, drink. And the Levites, because of their service, because they were serving in the temple, it wasn't just a few people. This was a rotating work. I mean, we're talking about a whole nation, okay? A whole nation that was serving uh, spiritual things to the whole nation. And this was work that was being rotated amongst many, many people. And obviously, these Levites, they weren't celibate. They, they, they weren't like popes without wives and kids. They had families that they needed to provide for themselves. But they would live off the things of the temple. They would live off the things that people would come in and give to the work of God. And then it says this, And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. So when, when the lamb, let's say, was sacrificed, they would then partake. They would eat. That was their food as well. Okay? It wasn't just wasted. When they'd sacrifice a lamb or sacrifice an ox or whatever, it wasn't just wasted food. It wasn't just burnt up to a crisp. They would then eat it. They would partake of that. That was their food. And this stuff was going on every day. Every day this was going on. So I'm, I'm, I guess then the, the priests would take food to their families and they had food. I I'm, I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't really tell us exactly how the practices were. Um, but that's talking about the Old Testament. Look at verse 14. Now verse 14 is interesting. Even so, even so, what does that mean? In the same way. So in the same way that the Old Testament priests would be sustained by the things that were given to the temple. In the same way, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. Okay? So they that preach the gospel should live off the gospel. So pa should pastors be paid? Yes. Should any workers, you know, anyone that's sort of put in relatively full-time work into a church, should they be paid? Yes. But here's the other thing. They should preach the gospel. Because how many pastors, right, how many churches pay for their pastor, which I'm not, I'm not against that, you know, praise God, that they're able to pay for their pastor so they can have a full-time job and provide, them, provide it for their families through the offerings of the church. Praise God. But then they're not preaching the gospel, right? You see the condition there, that they which preach the gospel should live off the gospel. So I never want to get to a point, hey, if I'm ever being able to, be able to provide for myself from the church offerings, and then stop preaching the gospel, at that point you should turn around and say, Kevin, you're not getting paid anymore until you go out again and preach the gospel. These pastors are ashamed that they're not even going out preaching the gospel and yet they're being paid by their church. 
hey, those things go together. You get paid, but you go and preach the gospel. Stop wasting your time. We see how important it was for Paul to preach the gospel that he refrained from being paid. And you're getting paid and you're not preaching the gospel. What a shame. What an embarrassment. Okay? I never want to be that way. If I'm that way, kick me out, guys. Please. Callum, you, you've got the courage. You've got the, you got the boldness to do that, right? Just, just grab me by the neck and kick me out. So this passage is probably one of the best evidences we have about tithing in the New Testament, okay? Now, people have, a lot of people have different views on tithing, okay? I don't want to, one day I'm going to preach a whole sermon on tithing. I think that, that deserves its own sermon. But it says, even so. So in the, in the Old Testament days, they would bring the tithe to the temple. And I'll, I'll just read to you Malachi 3.8 very quickly. Malachi 3.8, 9 and 10. The Bible says, Will a man rob God? Can a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. So how, have, how has Israel robbed God? When ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? God says, In tithes and offerings. So you're not giving your tithes, you're not giving your offerings, you're robbing God. How are you robbing God? I mean, God's got everything. God owns everything. How can you rob God? Verse 9, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation, the whole nation of Israel, were robbing God. They weren't doing the things properly um, for the temple. And then it says this in verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Why do we need to bring our tithe? What's, what's a tithe? The Bible, it's, it's 10%. Okay, the tithe represents 10%. Um, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. This is why a lot of Christians, and I, I have this practice, that I, I give 10% of my income um, even today, like, I still give 10%. Even though I'm the pastor, I still give 10% of my income to the church. Okay? And it's, that's a great thing, because I always know there's something in the offering. Like, <laughs> there's always something, right? Uh, because I, I'm always making sure that I give my 10%. But it says, He bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. What's the house of God in the Old Testament? The temple. What's the house of God in the New Testament? The church. Okay? And like we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, even so, in the same way, we should be doing this. And then he says, And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall, be not be, sorry, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. So he said, God said to Israel in the Old Testament, Look, just bring your tithes, bring your offerings. If you don't do it, I'm going to curse you. And if you do do it, I'm going to bless you and you're going to have more than you need. Okay? Now, I've already told you that there's been a change from the Old Testament to the New Testament. Everyone knows that. And I've already taught you how there's been a change in the blessings and cursings of the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? I mean, if you disobey God, the whole nation disobeying God, God's saying, I'm going to curse you. All right? But if you obey me, I'll bless you. But in the New Testament, the blessings and the cursings are through Christ. Okay, we're blessed because of what Christ has done for us. Okay, we're in Christ, we're blessed with Christ, we're blessed with faithful Abraham. But the curse that should come upon us for our disobedience was put on Christ. Christ became the curse for us. Okay, so we cannot be cursed by God as Christians, but we can be chastised. But chastised is much lighter than being cursed. Right? Being cursed is being, you know, you want, you know, you want um, evil to come upon those people. Whereas chastisement, I, I want to correct you. I just want to get you back in line. So it's, it's very different. It's, it's very loving. Whereas curse is anger and, you know, very, very uh, sort of a, a, a wrathful way of doing things. Um, but all that to say this. The question that comes to me a lot is, is tithing mandatory in the New Testament? Should we still give 10% of our increase in the New Testament like they did in the Old Testament? And my answer to that is, it depends what you mean by mandatory. It, it depends, okay? Now, because here's the thing. There's a lot of poor teaching on tithing, I think, I think in, 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 in our churches. A lot of Christians think, if I don't give 10% of my income to church, God's going to curse me, okay? And, and, and what happens is they give out of fear. Now, not everybody gives out of fear, but I'm saying a lot of people... In fact, what got me started tithing was out of fear. I heard about it for the first time. I'm like, man, I don't want to be cursed. So I started giving 10% of my income to church. Uh, obviously, I, I matured in time, and I'm, I'm happy to give. I'm not like, it's not out of fear. You know, it's something that I really want to do. I see the importance of it. We see the importance here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. But, <clears throat> but if, someone's, if someone's asking the question, do you believe it's mandatory in the sense that if you don't do it, you're going to be cursed by God, then no, I don't believe it's mandatory, if that's what you mean. 
okay? Because I don't believe in the curses and blessings the same way that are applied in the Old Testament as the New Testament. But if you are asking, like if someone comes to me and says, Kevin, okay, you don't believe it's mandatory, but if someone comes to me and says, okay, so what do you think we should give to the church? What's going to be my answer? 10%. Right? 10%. Why? Because we see the principle laid out throughout the whole scriptures. We see that whole principle being laid out. That's the way things were done in the Old Testament. It makes sense. Like when I started giving 10%, you know, it was a bit of a struggle because I wasn't even married yet. We were trying to save up for our wedding. And then what I found was as soon as I started doing it, it wasn't a big deal. I just give it. I don't even think about it. It just, it just comes out of my pocket. I give it to church. It's no big deal. Okay, so it's, it's kind of funny because some people think, well, you don't believe it's mandatory. And maybe you guys have your own opinion to this. You know, you don't believe it's mandatory. But then people think, well, then what? You're not giving 10%? Like they think you're trying to just keep it all to yourself and you don't want to give anything to the church. No, I still give my 10%. And I, I, I give usually more than 10% as well. You know, I, I don't care. I, I just give, I'm not, I'm not saying that to boast. I'm just being real to you. You know, if you're giving out of fear that you're going to be cursed, you're giving for the wrong reasons. You should be giving, knowing full well that that money is going to be used by God, going to be used by the church, and hopefully one day the Christian workers should be paid by that offering. And if, if nobody's given anything, it's never going to happen, right? It's never going to happen. And again, I'm not saying this because I need your money right now, okay? I promise, I promise like, this is just 1 Corinthians chapter 9. That's what we're up to. So I still believe you ought to give your 10%. I do believe that's the practice that God has laid out in the Old Testament, even so in the New Testament, okay? Now, I'll just give you one funny example of this. Um, in Australia, things are different. Pretty much everybody's got a job. Pretty much anybody can earn an income in Australia. But in Chile, things are a little bit different. You know, in a, it's not a third world country. It's more like a second world country in Chile. Um, but a lot of people don't have work. And um, a lot of people still grow, have farms you know, and have their chickens and stuff like that. Well, one of, my, one of my uncles is a pastor, and one of his church members, every now and again, she can't afford to give any money. She, she doesn't have anything, and obviously whatever she gets, she can't. Like, it's, it's, only, it's very few, and she needs it for food or whatever. But every now and again, she'd come to church and bring two chickens to the pastor, right? <laughs> two chickens that, that were, that were uh, grown out of a farm. She'd bring that, you know, she'd defeather it, so it's ready to go, ready to cook. So he'll just take it and then he'll cook it and eat it, you know, at home. That's her way of giving her 10%, which is pretty cool because that's the way they did it in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they would give their food, they'd give their livestock, they'd give drinks and stuff like that. But it's, it's funny, like we think of Western world, we think about, you know, people giving money. But in some of these other nations, you know, they, they give like what they can. They give whatever they can just to help provide for the, for the worker, to provide for the pastor. All right, let's look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. <clears throat> But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me. So I've not taken anything from you. I've not taken any money. I've not taken any chickens. I've not taken anything from you. And he goes, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so unto me. I'm not telling you that I need to be paid, is what he's saying. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. Okay, so he's not writing this to get paid. Um, Let's look at verse 16. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Whether I get paid or don't get paid, I'm going to preach the gospel. Okay? I'm not preaching the gospel because I'm getting paid to do so, says Paul. I do it out of necessity. All right? He says, I have nothing to glory of. And if you start glorying, if you start boasting about you soul winning, about how much soul winning you do, you boast about how many people you get saved, right? Trying to lift yourself up. That's the wrong attitude. That's the wrong behavior. Paul says, I don't glory of that. I do it because it's the necessity. And he goes, woe is unto me. It's such a bad thing. I'm so upset. I'm so depressed. I'm so cast down if I don't preach the gospel. And I, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, how we feel down with like when we, when we haven't, especially once you get into the habit, once you get into the habit of preaching week in, week out, knocking on doors, preaching the gospel, and you haven't done it for a while, you know, it starts to eat up in you and starts to build up and you just want to get out there, knock doors, and he's saying, this is how Paul feels. Hey, I'm just going out there. I don't want you thinking that I'm going out there, preaching the gospel to be paid. Otherwise, it's all for nothing. It's all void. He said in verse number 15. Um, 
So yeah, I mean, if churches are boasting about their numbers and boasting about soul winning, it's a shame unto them. All right? It's something out of necessity. It's something that we ought to do. Like if I came, you know, I don't have a full-time job anymore, but if I came home, you know, after my full-time job and, man, I worked so hard, why can't you guys appreciate me? It's like, no, you're the, you're the father, you're the husband of your house, you're the leader. You ought to go out and work and provide for your family. That's nothing to be boastful about. That's your responsibility. That's your work. Same thing as preaching the gospel. It's our responsibility to go out and preach that gospel. Um, <clears throat> verse 17, For if I do this thing willingly, so if, if I willingly go and preach the gospel, I have a reward. We'll see what that reward is soon. But if against my will, so if I don't want to preach the gospel, and I, look, honestly, there are many times I don't really want to do it, but I do it anyway. So Paul says the same thing. If against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Okay? So, even if I, I don't want to go soul winning, but I go and preach the gospel, it's committed unto me. Preaching the gospel is committed unto me. God has given me that commission to go and preach the gospel anyway, whether I'm willing or I'm not willing. But if I'm willing, there is a reward. Okay? There is a reward for that. What is that reward? A lot of people think of heavenly rewards, and that does tie into this a little bit, but look at verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily, what's his reward? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may, make, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. That's a bit weird. What's his reward for preaching the gospel willingly? That I do it freely. <laughs> okay, the fact that he can do it without getting paid, that he does it freely, is his reward. That's all he needs, he says. I don't need more than that. Just the fact that I can go and preach the gospel freely without getting paid. I'm not charging anybody to give them the gospel presentation. You know, there was, this happened once to me. I can't remember where this was. Uh, but I, I, kinda, I, was, I was laughing about it. I came to someone's door, started to give them the gospel, and they said, do I have to pay you? I'm like, no, no. I mean, <laughs> this is free. You know, I'm, I'm giving you a free gift. I'm hoping, you know. I don't, I don't think that person got saved, but they were afraid that by the time I, I, I finished preaching the gospel, they're going to have to pay me some money or something like that. Uh, Paul says, no, I, I do this freely. That's my reward. The fact that I can do it freely, without charge, that's my reward to go out and do it uh, willingly. And then verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I may, might gain the more. So is Paul a servant to any man? No, he's free. He's a free man, okay? He provides for himself. He, he's a tent maker. But even though he's a free man, even though he self-provides, even though he's not even taking any money from the church, though he has the ability to do so, he says, I still make myself a servant to all men. Why is he a servant? That I might gain the more. He wants to see more souls saved. So he makes himself a servant. And it doesn't matter who you are, what status you are in life. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or you're poor. When you go and preach the gospel, you are being a servant. You are lowering yourself. You are humbling yourself down to people so you can present the gospel. And hey, don't be full of boasting. Don't be full of pride. Paul is a servant to win more souls. Look at verse 20. And I, I love these next verses. I really do. Verse 20. And I think a lot of independent fundamental Baptists forget these verses. He says this, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew. So when he wants to preach the gospel to the Jews, he became like the Jews, that I might gain the Jews. Okay? He did not want to offend his uh, people. He did not want to offend the Jews. So when he came to preach the gospel to the Jews, he was like the Jews. He put himself under the law. He knows, like he was a Pharisee, he knows what it's like to live uh, Jewish in those days, right? So he'd become like them, probably made sure he didn't eat anything that was forbidden from the Old Testament so he wouldn't offend them, so he could uh, fellowship with them, work with them, and preach the gospel to them. He says this there in, uh, to them that are under the law, as under the law. So those that are under the law, I became like under the law, that I may gain them that are under the law. So was he under the law? No, he's not under the law because he's saved. But to preach to the Jews, he put himself under the law so he would have something in common with them to win the Jews to Jesus Christ. And as Australians, we ought to become like Australians. Right? I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. When I, when I go to Chile, 
and I talk about the gospel, I should also become like a Chilean, right? You know, there are different cultures in the world, right? If I go and preach the gospel to, I don't know, like to different areas, I might change my approach. I might change my appearance. I might be more sensitive to the customs and the cultures of that country so that way I can make sure that I can preach the gospel to those people. And, you know, I'll just share this with you. Um, and this is where, where I say a lot of independent fundamental Baptists forget this, is, you know, obviously a lot of preachers dress nicely. I'm not against that. You know, putting a, a nice little jacket on, putting a tie. One day I'm going to come in with a tie, just to surprise you. Oh, you know, put on a tie. And I'm, I'm fine with that. You know, I think you should look nice. I think you should look presentable, especially when you're standing behind the pulpit and preaching the gospel. But then some churches put uh, a rule in place that when you go and preach the gospel, you've got to make sure you're dressed properly, adequately. You know, with your pants, with your, with your suit, with your tie. And I, that's what I used to do, because I used to be in a church that dressed really nicely like that. And then I'd go knock doors and preach the gospel. Now, it took me a while to realize that I wasn't getting much success doing that. All right? And I, I cover this in the lessons for soul winning, right? Do I? I can't remember now. Anyway, um, and then I, what I realized was, if I took off my tie... Oh, that's rebellious, Kevin. Right? But if I took off my tie, I'd have more people come into the door. And then I realized if I took off my jacket, I had more people come into the door. Then I realized if I took off my shirt and put on a polo top, I'd have more people come into the door. The more I looked like a neighbor, the more I looked neighborly, the less I looked like this religious, you know, because people think of you as a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or whatever, the less likely they were to come to the door. And then I realized, oh, my Bible, that's what I, that's what I mentioned in my video. Oh, I'm going to put my Bible in my pocket. <laughs> and I started to look less, you know, churchy. And I had more people coming to the door and I was able to have more conversations. And so I don't have a, a fixed rule of your, of your dress. Because if we're going to be a church that goes and preaches the gospel to the neighborhood afterwards, then I want you to be dressed in a way that we can win more. That we can be like the Australians, right? We can do more for him. And that's why sometimes you'll see me, sometimes I forget, but sometimes after, after the service I'll take off this shirt and put on a polo top just so I look a lot more neighborly because I want to be able to have more conversations. I want to win more to the Lord. And I remember one pastor saying to a friend of mine, if you came to my door dressed in your shorts and your polo top, I would not answer the door. Yeah, because you're an independent fundamental Baptist and you're full of tradition, you're not even thinking about how can I win more people to the Lord, right? And so that's why my dress standards, you know, I want you to be neat and tidy. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not expecting you to come to church in, in ripped jeans and, and look like a slob. Okay? Because if you look like a slob, guess what? They're not going to open the door either. Right? You're going to need to look neat and tidy, look presentable, like a smart, casual kind of look is probably what I'm after. And that's how you're going to get more success in Australia. Now, maybe in America, maybe in the United States, uh, you know, dressing with your, your tie and your jacket, maybe you get more responses that way. There are different cultures. Okay? I, I know... America is like a Western culture and so are we, but still, culturally, we're very different. People are very different. Australians are much more laid back than Americans. Okay? Americans are workaholics. You know? And my brother lives in America, and he's a workaholic. He fits there just fine. Right? But we're, we're a lot more laid back. We're, we're more likely to, to, to have fun, you know, laugh at ourselves and that kind of stuff. Americans are not like that. Right? If you laugh at Americans, they get offended much, much easier than Australians. I've experienced that. But hey, we need to tailor ourselves... Um, to make sure that we can win more, to the, more lost to Jesus Christ. And that's what, that's what uh, Paul did. Let's look at verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this is another thing in Sydney. I'm, I'm going to apply the weak here with the really poor people. In Sydney, there are places that are like um, housing commission, where people don't even have a house, like they can't even afford their own house. And usually they're not even working. Usually they're, they're completely on welfare, 100% on welfare. That's how they sustain themselves. And those places, some of these areas stink. There are like broken beer bottles and it's just, it, it's disgusting. Like I, I, I kind of try to hold my breath when I'm talking to people at the door. But you know what? I don't go dressed. I, I, that's when I usually take off my, you know, and I put on, I look a lot more casual because I want them not to think, who's this guy coming in this suit and tie you know, and they won't open the door, but I dress in a way and I speak to them in a way, so, you know, I'm not using big religious words or anything like that. I speak to them just in common English language and present the gospel as best I can to them. And that's how I, I think of Paul when he says he comes to the, to the weak, he comes as weak, that he might gain the weak. 
I made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What a great attitude. What a great attitude. That he makes himself, he conforms himself to all men so that he can win some. Now some people have taken, especially the liberal churches, have taken this to the extreme. Right? They'll say, well, you know, if I want to win my, you know, uh, win my buddies you know, um, who are alcoholics, then I'll go to the pub with them. I'll have a few beers with them. I'll get drunk with them. So they know I'm just one of the guys, you know. And they think, well, it's fine. You know, no, you know, sinning is never right. You know, even if it's preaching the gospel. And if you're drunk, you're not going to be able to preach the gospel anyway. You're not going to be filled with the Holy Spirit because you're going to be filled with alcohol. All right? So this is not saying, hey, you can sin as long as, you know, you can win some. No, because look what he says this in, uh, well, where does it say that? Oh, wait, verse number 21. Did I read that properly? I, I didn't finish reading it. But to them that are without law, as without law, this is when he's talking about the Jews, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That, that's something that I forgot to mention. So what he says is, even though I make myself under the law uh, to reach the Jews, he says, and, but he's not under the law, he says he's under the law of Christ. He's under the law of Christ. So we don't disregard the commandments of God. We don't disregard the law of God when we're trying to reach the lost, okay? We don't go in sin and, and make ourselves look foolish, okay? No, we're still under the law of Christ, okay? So if you tailor yourself to reach someone, you still need to make sure that you're obedient to the laws of God. That's something that I just wanted to cover there. Uh, but verse 23, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. So Paul is trying to motivate and share his passion of the gospel with the church. He's trying to share the passion, get them motivated. Hey, we're partakers of this. We're working together. I do this for the gospel's sake. So we can be partakers. We can work together. Uh, the next verse expands on this. Verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a, in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. So now he's talking about a reward, a heavenly reward. Not just a reward of preaching the gospel in this life, but he's talking about the heavenly rewards that it comes to preaching the gospel. And he says, look, know ye not that they which run a race run all. Guess what? You're all in the race. You might say, Kevin, I've never preached the gospel. I've never knocked on a door. You're still in the race. Okay, then he says, run all. Okay, all of us ought to run. All of us ought to get into this ministry of preaching the gospel to this community. You know, it's, it's about participating. That's why Paul is encouraging the church. Hey, be partakers with me in this work. And then verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they, that, now, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. So he's talking about those that literally run a race, like the Olympics like the athletes and people that play sports, people that are literally running around for a living, he says they do so, they do, they do so um, to win the prize, but they do so to obtain a corruptible crown. So any awards you win for winning a sporting event or you run a race, you win a gold medal at the Olympics, I mean, great, great work. I mean, you, you've worked hard for it, great. But it's a corruptible crown. It's not going to last forever, okay? It's temporal. And, I mean, who won, which... Which, which sprinter won the 100 meters in 1966 if there was an Olympics during that time? Who knows? <laughs> Who cares? It doesn't matter anymore. It was a corruptible crown, right? It was great for them at the time, but now hey, no one even remembers their name probably. Who, you know, who, who did it back then? But then he says this, but we are incorruptible. So we run the race. We want to win that prize. That prize is for anybody that can win that race, that can run that race. It's an incorruptible crown that we're aiming for, the treasures in heaven. Verse 26, and this is what motivates Paul as well, the treasures in heaven. I therefore so run. The reason I run this race, the reason I preach the gospel, the reason I try to win more to the Lord is to get that incorruptible crown. So therefore, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't do this uncertainly. I know I'm going to be rewarded. Even though I'm not going to be paid by the church, I know the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reward me. I'm certain about it. So fight I. I get into the fight, he says. Not as one that beateth the air. I'm not someone that's just fighting the air. You know, like I'm just punching nothing. No, it's hitting something. We're, ha we're having success. I'm certain that we're going to win 
the incorruptible crown. And even though this first Corinthian church was so messed up, Paul says you can be a partaker of this. Run the race with him. He's getting them motivated. He's getting them encouraged. And that's what we were doing yesterday, guys. We were running the race. And again, let me just say this to the ladies or the children. You know, we need someone to look after the kids. <laughs> so don't feel like I'm criticizing you for not being out there knocking doors. I want you knocking out doors. I want you out there. But at the same time, you looking after the kids, you know, you know, getting the food organized, getting the area, you know, that helps us. That gives us the ability, the freedom to be able to go out and knock the doors, okay? So we're not worried about everything else that's going on um, elsewhere. But again, I said, I said to the guy, I said, I, I really would like us men one day to stay and look after the kids and let our wives go out and knock doors, okay? The wives are going like, no, no, <laughs> we, we, we'll try that one. We've we got to try it one day, okay? I, I reckon our wives will get more people saved than us. I reckon people are going to be more willing to listen and open doors to ladies than to the, you know, the, you know, these ugly looking men. You know? <laughs> but then look at this in verse 27. I'll finish off with well, this is the last verse. Finish off with this. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. So now he's talking about himself personally. Yes, he's running the race, preaching the gospel, you know, going for the prize, but then he brings his body under subjection. Lest by any means, when I have preached unto others... I myself should be a castaway. We need to be careful about this. Like we can get motivated, let's go win souls, let's knock doors, yeah, let's do great things. And it is great. It is a great thing. But make sure at the same time that you keep your body under subjection. You look out for yourself as well. Yes, you're looking out for the needs of others. Yes, you're looking out for the souls of others. But then what about your own Christian life, your own Christian walk? How are you doing? How are you performing? You know? Are you, do you disregard God in all other areas of your life, but you're just doing the gospel preaching? It's great. But what if your life's falling apart? What if you're struggling with sins? You know, um, you can become a castaway. Yes, you win all these people to the Lord. Yeah, they can go to church and be these great Christians, but then you could just fall away. You know, you spent so much time and energy on other people, and you've let your own Christian life fall apart. And Paul's just saying, hey, we need to make sure we have that balance. Keep our bodies under subjection. Under subjection to who? under subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. The flesh needs to be subject to the spirit of man as well. Okay, the new spirit, the new man that God has given us, we need to be careful with what we do. Again, so we can be more effective in gospel preaching, but at the same time, we need to make sure we have that balance. It's not all about gospel preaching. It's about looking after yourselves, learning the gospel, overcoming sin, you know, being a, a better Christian you know, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just keep that in mind. Now let me tie in this to Resurrection Sunday. All right, now, most churches are preaching on the resurrection, and it's a praise God, glory to God for His resurrection, that we serve a living Savior, okay? But how do you think God's going to be glorified with His resurrection? Us talking about the resurrection? Or us going and preaching the gospel? <laughs> because preaching the... What is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection, is it not? Okay? Is it not the fact that if he was not resurrected, we would yet still be in our sins? Okay? And all of this would be vain. Okay? So how do we glorify God? How do we honor his resurrection? We go tell people about it. We go knock doors. We preach the gospel. And again, churches today full of people praising God for his resurrection. But what are you doing about it? What are you doing? Are you using it? Are you going out and telling people about how Christ was resurrected from the dead, that he had power over sin, power over hell, and power over death, and he can save you from your sins? He can save you from going to hell. Is that what, is that what they're doing? No. They're just saying, yeah, great, the resurrection. Hey, we're doing something about it. This church is doing something about it. I'm not boasting about it. This is just our work. Necessity is laid upon us to do this work. Let's pray.